Good morning and happy Friday. My name is Phyllis Newbill. I'm here to welcome you to our ICAT play date this morning. I am the Associate Director at the Center for Educational Networks and Impacts, which is one of several centers within ICAT. A few housekeeping things before we get started this morning. Um, we are videoing this morning and live streaming, so we're on YouTube and we'll exist on YouTube after, we, we live streaming now and, and this will exist on YouTube after the event, so just be aware of that. Um, there's a sign-in sheet somewhere in the room, um, so make sure you sign in and let us know that you're here. We use that to justify donuts and coffee, which is super important. It's maybe the most important part about iCat's play dates. Make sure you do that. Please enjoy donuts and coffee. Um, they are here. For our friends who are online, good morning. I'm glad you're here as well. Um, if you have questions when you're online, make sure you use that questions link and we'll get those questions read out here. Um, if you have questions in the room, or when you have questions in the room, we'll, we'll allow time at the end for conversation and questions. Um, so just wait for me to get to you with the microphone so that our friends online will be able to hear you. Um, if Professional Development Network credit is helpful to you as a faculty member or grad student at Virginia Tech, make sure that you check in with me and, and or sign in on the, uh, the clipboard so that we make sure that we get you credit. A uh, couple of announcements this morning. The New Music Technology Festival continues. It's been going on this week. Um, Brandon's been up late and, and back here early in the morning to manage that, so we're glad you're here. Uh, that continues. There's a concert tonight at 8 in the Cube, yes? And then more concerts tomorrow, so just check the ICAT webpage for all of the details there. Um, and have you all been part of some of those? Did you? Oh, good. Excellent. Okay, good. What, your concert is today. Tonight. tonight, okay, good. Well, you all will tell more about that. I knew, th I knew there was a connection. Um, and also make sure you come to ICAT Day. Um, ICAT Creativity and Innovation Day is Monday, April 29th. We'll be in the Moss Art Center from 10 to 2, sharing story, uh, stories and projects that are um, at the nexus of science, engineering, arts, and design. Um, and then we'll have a reception at 2.30 in the Cube. And about 5.30, we'll come back over here to the Performance Hall for The Beat Goes On concert. So with no more further ado, um, I want to turn it over to our speakers this morning. I'm so glad you all are here from Montreal, uh, from the McGill Schulich. I didn't get that pronunciation first. Schulich School of Music. I'll let you do the French version. Um, they tell me that the way to pronounce their center is Kermit. Um, and Fabrice, Philippe, and Rochelle are starting us off. And uh, Fabrice, I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, Phyllis. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so uh, my name is Fabrice Marandola. I'm the director of Kermit, Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Music, Media, and Technology. Um, and I'm here with my colleagues, Philippe Aubert-Gautier and Rachel Gousseral. They are associate directors for Arctic Research and Science and Technology. And we will give you a very brief overview of what our center is about, um, why we are developing ties with ICAT, and uh, the cube, and uh, also ex short examples of our personal research, so we kind of give you examples of the very broad range of things that are done. So we are hosted at the Schulich School of Music in Montreal at McGill University. Um, we are here on the eighth floor of the new building. We have a suite of uh, labs with uh, various uh, types of equipment and things like that, which are uh, for all uh, for our researchers and students. And in the, in the minus second floor, uh, in the basement, we have this huge room, um, which is uh, a quite a unique uh, room and, and place to be able to do some research. So we will have a bit more on that later. Uh, briefly, we are a multidisciplinary, multi-institution uh, center. So it's not just McGill. We have four core partner universities, and we have about 60 uh, regular members, so profs who are dedicated to research around what we do. 250 grad students and uh, about 90 collaborators at the international level. Um, so it's, the center is also a research platform where we have equipment and labs that are available to all the researchers, all the students. Everyone has equal access. Uh, and basically the idea is that you come to do your research that you couldn't do on your own in your own lab. And uh, so one of those, this one is the um, uh, critical listening uh, lab. We have uh, several of this type of labs where we do multiple things, uh, but equipped with uh, motion capture and uh, those um, 
different laboratories, we can change the acoustic physically, uh, we can change the panels, etc. And they're really flexible in their use and usage. Um, and then the next one, which is uh, pretty uh, spectacular, is our, our, own, our own version of the tube, it's a rectangle, and we call it the MMR, multimedia room. Um, where we, it was just renovated and we can do many things from uh, concerts to recordings to experiments and things like that. I will turn the mic to uh, Philippe Aubert that will give you a bit more detail. Thank you. Hello. So yes, the MMR is great because it's actually a, a room which is very similar to the cube here. So it's a, a room with a diffuser, the white panels that you can see. It's equipped with 64 channels. Uh, and also uh, moving curtains that was shown just on the before slide. So it's a variable acoustic space. So we can change short reverb time to super long reverb time, and we can also do 3D audio. There's another cool thing is uh, maybe you see them, the tiny suspended loudspeaker. There's, uh, sorry, uh, microphones. There's 22 of them. So we also have an artificial reverberation system, but it's not uh, artificial in terms of digital. It's just taking the 22 mic signals and resending them to the loudspeaker just to recirculate the reverb and extend the reverb up to, let's say, 10 seconds. So it's very nice. It's kind of a, of a laboratory also for uh, studying large ensemble because you can play with acoustics and see how this will affect, for example, um, the orchestra. And behind it, we have the control room. There's actually a window between the two. So it's a dome of um, 37 uh, sp speakers connected real time to an ambisonic microphone inside the MMR. So we have full 3D audio, real-time monitoring of what's happening. And we also do live concert in that laboratory. So back to Fabrice. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, so briefly what we are doing in terms of research. So we, everyone you will see is, is collaborating with someone that the purpose of being a member of Kermit. You do research with colleagues who have expertise which is complementary to yours. But to try to organize our research, we have four axes. Um, so the first one, if it wants to show up at some point. Yes. Um, instruments, devices, and systems. Uh, Rachel will speak about, uh, about this one a bit uh, later. The second one, mu music information research. So lots of things around uh, big data analysis, uh, optical recognition of scores. Uh, it goes from like the very first manuscript to uh, modern things and how do you archive uh, music with media, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of research around that. The third one, cognition, perception, and movement. I will speak a bit about that. It's like really about you know, how we make music uh, physically, how we perceive music and everything around that. And the last one, expanding musical practice, where it's basically, um, very briefly, how the output, artistic output of everything else that is done in the other research axis, and we give you some examples. So I will give you very brief examples of what I do. So I'm a percussionist and ethnomusicologist, and yet director of a research center for science and technology of music. Um, so I'm interested by the analysis of movement, and uh, this very particular and specific relationship that any, uh, musicians, instrumentalists have with their own instruments. And of course, I've been looking at uh, at percussion, uh, we're so looking at marimba uh, and basically timpani drums and things like that. So it has a couple of, of different uh, outputs, uh, which go towards like the methodology, how do you capture movement, how uh, you are able to go in detail, how can you look at the signature, personal signature of each individual versus what is common to everyone else, and with all the implications of the pedagogical level. Uh, so when you see on the top right, for example, you have two pictures with me at 20 years apart when I first did some motion capture, and then the last one we have some mallets which are equipped with the sensors embedded in the mallets and to try to make things lighter in the capture and to do some rendition and things like that. Um, and I'm trying to do the same thing in Cameroon. I'm a specialist of music from Cameroon and working with the musicians over there. And of course, to transport a lab of motion capture is complicated, so you use different techniques and you use the background, you see you go in the trees and you clamp your little uh, cameras to, to recreate things, but you're able actually with like various kind of DIY ways of doing things to, to track the same kind of information. It's what is really interesting to me is to see how uh, the movement is like processed in the same way 
are there differences, et cetera, et cetera, and working on expertise versus learners. Um, another subset of the movement is the eye hand centralization, so movement of the eye. For a xylophone player, we are constantly looking at where we are playing, but in fact, it triggers lots of, of uh, very interesting things, so on the anticipation and how people are training their eye while they're playing the same way they're training their, their movements. And uh, lots of very interesting things, and I try to do it also in Cameroon and in Canada and France with a classical percussionist. Um, so it's also interesting because it also opens like the idea of what do we see, or how do we represent ourselves in space, and what do you see when you have your eyes closed, which is a very interesting question. Um, so that's uh, an ongoing process. And I will go briefly with two examples of uh, research creation project as a percussionist and, and that are linked to Kermit. So this one was a huge, uh, crazy project outside in Montreal for three nights where we overcome the Place des Festivals and had like a qualifying system outside and live music, live electronics. And it was the first time that Radio Canada was broadcasting in 360 degrees and we came up with a way to be able for people to like have the sound around them and when they, you turn around, you have the sound going around. So there was a commit uh, support for that. And then the last one is um, a Jail Seed uh, that we have, a little program. I work with my colleague Dominique Thibault and Myriam Boucher. And we got an inspiration from the first polytop of Zenakis that was in Montreal. And we built a new installation uh, with strings, uh, uh, piano strings, very long, some transducer, some uh, piezo, uh, real-time transformation of the sound and light. And uh, at the very end, a TS, so where Rachel is working, we have some engineering students who are working on a new version because this one was DIY and want to be able to have one which is for the future. So speaking about research creation, I will pass the mic to Philippe. Thank you. So the research creation is really uh, the expanded musical practice. So we have a set, for instance, uh, instance of uh, five to six live at Kermit event every year. So it's a full week residency in the MMR, concluding with a, a show on the Friday. But it's great because the artist or the researcher can really explore the room as an instrument. So this is one of uh, the example of the outreach we have in this uh, side of the thing. Besides that, all the research access related to research and creation, you have to know that there we have many members that are composer, musicians, and everything. And the goal is really to show that hardcore uh, scientific or technological research can go down to the concert, down to the conference, or in a performance situation. It's really the, we want to prove that it's not only, you know, theoretical ideas in the cloud. So it's part of the, the thing. This is just one of example. And I will just provide also, like Fabrice, just one example of my own personal research within the context of the Kermit. So for me, I mostly work in audio 3D and sound art, um, but this is just one example. I would like to take two minutes maybe for that maximum. It's uh, in, you know, some people actually hear voice in their head, uh, at a very hallucination, but it's not cool to call that this way, but just to make it clear, it's an, uh, form, some form of uh, hallucination. And uh, uh, it's a team for this project where with uh, people from psychiatry, uh, sound engineering um, actors and things like that because I was contacted by a psychiatrist and he wanted to do a simulator, a 3D simulator of voice hearing because voice hearing is an immersive phenomenon. If you hear voice, it might be in the ventilation system or something like that. And the goal is to create a simulator for the training of psychiatrist or a social worker so that when they encounter somebody living with uh, voice hearing, it's more like uh, we call that therapeutic alliance or more empathy. So we have been working in this kind of space to do 3D recordings of actors playing the, the voice for the simulator. It's just one of the many examples uh, of the project between, you know, really technology, the platform. Here it's a semi anechoic room, but also kind of creation. So now if I pass the mic to Rachel. Okay, so uh, like Fabrice said, I'm uh, an electrical engineer and my work fits mostly in research access one, which is instruments and devices. I work with intraoral technologies, advanced intraoral technologies, so things that we put in our ear that don't just give us audio playback. What we do is we have an in-ear microphone, a microphone outside of the ear and a miniature loudspeaker, and we use this device for different applications. 
because this device gives us access to many signals that are captured from inside of the ear, like your speech, your breathing, your heart rate, coughing, clicking of the teeth, and even a blink of an eye can capture it through these in-ear devices. And what we're going to do is we're going to use these devices to understand different concepts ranging from speech production. So the way we speak is actually dependent on how we hear ourselves and the world around us. So there's a feedback loop, but there's also a feed forward loop. So I have an experience, and if I see that someone's far away from me, for example, I know that I need to raise my effort, but also I have to hear myself, and the way I hear myself makes me adjust the way that I speak. So right now it's a bit different for me because I hear an amplified version of my own speech playing back. So we use this to try to understand how we speak in very difficult situations, whether it's speech and noise, for example, or if I have hearing impairment, how do I speak, especially in noise, because now I don't actually have an engaged Lombard effect, which means that I would like to remain intelligible in noisy situations so that you can understand me even though there is noise. We also want to enhance communication in these types of environments, especially for workers who are exposed to very noisy um, environments. We are creating a radio acoustical virtual envi environment, a uh, rave to keep it interesting. And what we're trying to do here is to have people communicate even when they're wearing communication devices, but in a very natural way. So that means I speak very differently based on where you are. So if someone's super close to me, I'm going to speak a little bit softer so that they can understand me. It doesn't really work here because it's amplified to understand me anyway. But if someone's farther away from me, I'm going to raise my voice. And if there's noise in the room, I'm going to raise my voice. And the idea here is without having to constantly click a radio that tells me I'm about to speak, I can just speak naturally. And based on how I'm speaking and the noise level inside of the room, I'm going to send my communication only to speakers or listeners within a certain distance. We also aim to do early disease detection because all of those signals that I mentioned that I can capture from inside of the ear are actually signals that get affected in some neurodegenerative diseases and they get affected quite early, almost 10 to 20 years before a diagnosis is made. So we're particularly looking at diseases such as Parkinson's disease, where we're going to look at your swallowing and breathing patterns. People who have Parkinson's are going to take an in exhale, after, uh, an inhale after they swallow and not an exhale, which is normal people, that's what they do. And we're going to look at changes in your articulation, because as we start losing muscle control, we start changing the way that we articulate our speech. And those are all very, very subtle in the beginning and very difficult to diagnose. We're also looking to try to detect early Alzheimer's, also looking at their speech. But now we're not going to look at how you're saying something, but what you're saying. People who have Alzheimer's tend to use the same themes over and over. And they're going to start using verbs more than nouns. And they're going to reduce their vocabulary over time. So we're going to use natural language processing to be able to detect such a thing. And we also aim to use your biosignals, such as your breathing, your heart rate, as well as the blinking of the eyes, to try to measure stress. Because people who do have mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's tend to have difficulty understanding speech and noise, even though they have perfect hearing. So they will have a good audiogram, but they end up not being to un able to understand speech and noise. And this is because it's at the cognitive level that it's happening and not at the mechanical level of the ear. So we anticipate that these types of situations cause stress, and we would like to see if that happens. So we'd like to acknowledge all of our funding partners. We are funded by uh, government funds like uh, the Fonds de Recherche de Québec through three different sectors, so society and culture, nature and technology, as well as health. We're also funded by Innovation Québec. Uh, and we regroup, like Fabrice said, four different universities, so McGill, University of Montreal, University of Sherbrooke, and my university, which is École de Technologie Supérieure. If you're interested in knowing more about the Kermit, you could actually watch a very cool video uh, that shows all of our facilities if you check out the QR code. And we're open to any questions. And don't forget the show tonight at 8 at the Cube, if you arrive after the introduction. 8 at the Cube. Five work from the Kermit members. We. Oui. What questions do we have?
So really interesting stuff. Um, I appreciate the presentation. Uh, my question for you is just cognizant of uh, Montreal's focus on, uh, of course, supporting uh, francophones and English speakers. How does that kind of intersect with how you guys present material to people? Are there any sort of uh, things that have specifically emerged from that are projects to observe those two languages and balance where you guys are located? In terms of language of presentations? Um, it's, it's very interesting because we, we, we are located in McGill, so we speak a lot of English, but in fact, most of the crew is, is francophone. Uh, like the three of us, we are all francophone, as you can hear, <laughs> maybe. Um, and our technicians also, but it's, uh, so most of the time the, the, the we present in, in English, but everyone is bilingual, more or less, and we make an effort to, uh, to do bilingual uh, slides, for example, often when I do a presentation, I have, I speak English and I have the, the slide in French or we do this kind of thing, yeah. And the, the Front de Recherche du Québec, because the Quebec government, which is francophone, Quebec is officially francophone, uh, pushes a lot to try to publish in French as well. But most of our communication and, uh, not communication, the communication is all bilingual, like everything is bilingual, our website, all communications, but the, the publications are often in English. Hey, uh, cool presentation. Uh, I really wanted to ask you about those um, really cool multi-channel spaces that you have. So you, are, you already have, uh, it looks like a really great density of speakers. What do you envision is the next thing for sound in those spaces? That's a very good question because the final uh, renovation of the room is, was happening while the COVID so we still feel like it's brand new. We made last year the inauguration, right? The last fall. So that's a very good question. I don't actually know. I think we have some updates to do. But uh, first thing first is that we have to produce more, I think, work inspired from that. Like for instance, uh, for me, I hope to work like personally as a researcher this summer in the in a space with a quatuor, a string quartet, and really change probably the reverb for every note and really use the room as a meta instrument and do some uh, video montage or something like that. And this is one example. So for me, first is create more stuff. And I know there's uh, plans also for update and then Fabrice will continue. Yeah, one, one of the plans is uh, maybe um, to apply for another set of grants, but to go with a WFS system uh, at the space know, width, which is huge. Uh, another one is like vi uh, volumetric video um, capture, so we can do things. Uh, right now, Rachel didn't say, but she has a big project on motion capture in this huge space with like 30 persons roaming around in noise condition and things like that. But we want to go to the next step, yeah. Uh, but right now, as, as people have said, like we are discovering the room as we go. So we are learning more and more how to fine tune uh, the balance between the physical system and the electronic system of reverberation. Uh, but it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, the, the flexibility of the system, so you, you click a button and you switch, uh, and it's very, very powerful. Uh, but then we are learning the limits and we're trying to, to listen. One thing which is we, that we didn't mention is that it's extremely quiet room. It's like, I think, uh, for noise at 16, uh, 15. We actually tried to measure the background noise level and we were not able to clearly capture it with the BNK uh, microphone because we were kind of down to the noise floor of the microphone, but it was just NC15 maybe or something. Anyway, uh, just to say it's, it's actually so good that your question is very interesting because I didn't fully think about it, but I think the uh, reply by uh, Fabrice, uh, it's clear that if we compare like for the cube, having a higher density, you know, uh, ground, not ground level, but uh, horizontal plane wave synthesis would be kind of the logical next step so that we can play a little bit like you, high density uh, at the listening, in the listening plane and less uh, density of speaker uh, up. Other than the obviously very amazing uh, audio system that you have integrated into the space, do you have other systems integrated in space, lighting, network technology, things of that nature, permanently? 
uh, well, we do have a yeah, lightning system and uh, networking. We have all the capabilities. Uh, something we didn't mention, all the labs uh, are interconnected between themselves, and including the one downstairs, so you can do things in real time. So now, for example, the video capture, like when we do videos of showing things like that, we don't do it downstairs, we do it from the labs. Uh, so we, we do that, and the idea is to integrate as much as possible all the systems, and that's the part we're doing right now, the integration, because you have to develop something specific to be able to get access to all the details, but in the meantime, to make it not so cumbersome for users that you know researchers can be as independent as possible once the setup is done. So the way we work, uh, the, the technicians are helping you know the researchers to set up their their experiment, and then we are on our own. So there's a the transmission of knowledge from researchers, researchers, students to students. You know, like you've been doing that, you've been synchronizing EEG with motion capture, with sound, with video, how did you do that? Well, I developed this method and then we pass it along. Uh, yeah. How big is your technical staff? <laughs> how big is your technical staff? Very small. <laughs> we have uh, three. They are really good. <laughs> <laughs> but we have three. So that, but plus we have, you know, uh, like people we, we hire when we have like productions and things like that for concerts. Uh, but the permanent staff is actually two full-time and two part-time uh, persons that are complementary. Um, yes, so we we aim to expand, but that's why uh, it's interesting because you know it's it's a challenge obviously. But in the meantime, it forces people to communicate much more and to have the knowledge transmitted amongst everyone who is using. So, for example, motion capture. Uh, we have our technician who is like on a regular basis making. As soon as three, four, five students or researchers are interested by doing some, we have a workshop, and then for two, three days of work, they learn, and then they go to someone is, you know, that's how I did it, and, and so that's one of the ways to do it. So it's helping to foster what we want, which is interdisciplinarity. So our job, really, as directors, we don't tell anyone what to do. We are here to help everyone else do what they want. So that's a very interesting thing, because I don't I don't direct anyone <laughs> on what their research, uh, you know, the research is really uh, coming from from the members. Uh, and, and really, our job is also to help people to identify who could help you realize your project. So we are all working in collaboration. Like, none of the things we're doing is our, just us. Like we are always working with some colleagues of some sort. Uh, and that's the beauty of it, yeah. And you're welcome. <laughs> Can you all talk about your disciplines? I, you have this interdisciplinary research, and I think you mentioned a little bit, but can you talk just quickly about your disciplines and how you got from the discipline, like when you started in your discipline, were you figuring on coming here, or how did you get here? Uh, that's a good question. You mean individually, or like as a center, or? Um, individually. Okay, okay, yeah. good, thank a, you. Sorry, it's my yeah. French brain sometimes need uh, processing time. Uh, I think it's interesting. I think what I really like about the Kermit, uh, just looking you know, from a more general perspective, is that I feel that all people there are kind of similar to myself, which is a weird way to say that it's cool. But uh, it means lots of people have been going through you know, non-regular path. I was, uh, for instance, uh, a student in engineering, mechanical engineering, and studying acoustics. But my goal was to do sound art, so I just picked the engineering path and doing music on the side and sound art. And I found many of my colleagues at the Kermit go through kind of similar path, like studying music, but then turning to science. So something which I find very efficient in the case of the Kermit, I don't know if you feel it, is that sometimes I've been on interdisciplinary project, but people are not by themselves, like not that much navigating. And it's more of a challenge to have a functioning team. But I know that if I talk with Fabrice for a random project, it could, it's going to go very quick, and probably same with you, Rachel, and, or anybody at the Kermit, because people have been actually playing, you know, I think it's something very distinctive of not the center, but maybe just the community, which is like even more important than the rooms and gear and things like that. I don't know if it's an answer to your question. Oh, yeah. 
I think I'm going to try to answer your question. So I did my bachelor's and my master's in electrical engineering. I really wanted to do something related to music, but clearly I was the other side of the brain and I couldn't learn an instrument. I didn't have the discipline to learn an instrument, so I decided to use uh, my knowledge of math and physics to apply it to something that goes towards music and I ended up building audio equipment and we ended up going through hearing protection, which you know, you wanna preserve your hearing if you really wanna listen to music at a high quality for a long period in your life. And from hearing protection, I went towards intraoral devices and hearables. And then through hearables, we went to uh, early disease detection and then you start finding your collaborators at Kermit. So it's like, oh, we do biosignals from inside of the ear. Oh, I'm interested in seeing how do we measure musical flow? from you know, your inside of your ear through your physiological signals. So that's kind of how we went from super engineering, building equipment to uh, something more interdisciplinary. And I have the opposite. Uh, I'm a percussionist by training. Mm -hmm. uh, and also ethnomusicologist, I discovered uh, ethnomusicology while I was at Sorbonne in musicology. And then I wanted to study uh, polyphony, vocal polyphonies for the pygmies in a group of pygmies in the Bajan in Cameroon. And then I needed to, to hack systems, uh, record and multi-track, uh, analyze uh, each voice, transform them, and et cetera. So I, I learned how to use softwares from IACAM and how to record multi-track. I was the first one to do the multi-track recording and, and digital audio in the middle of nowhere in, uh, in Africa. And then when I came to McGill, I discovered I met Marcelo Van Der Lee, who is a researcher, uh, and he made me wear this like fancy motion capture thing. And then I was like, whoa, that's really cool. I can learn a lot about my motion, motion of others. And that's how I got interested and developed this knowledge. In the meantime, I, I did the first concert at Kermit, the first live at Kermit, uh, working with sensors and uh, electronics and things like that. And here we are, years later. Uh, so it's, I think the most important uh, is that everyone who comes to Kermit is interested by collaborating and has an interest, deep, profound passion for sound and music. So I think that's what you need, everyone. And, and then what is the most important is to learn how to talk to each other uh, because we use the same words and vocabulary, but they, it has different meanings depending from where we come from. And lots of the first meetings all the time is spent on what do you mean by your hand? <laughs> what do you mean by pitch or whatever? And so that's what we do, but that's what makes us come together. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are at time this morning, so we're, we'll wrap up. I hope that everyone will hang around for a little while and continue conversation as you wish. Um, have a great weekend, and we will be back here same time, same place with another mind-blowing presentation and more donuts next Friday morning. See you then. Thank you. <laughs>